gold is the only financial asset that runs no counterparty risk. This is what you're voting for. This is what I'm voting for. They now have to keep printing or we crash. We've got this ticking time bomb. Talking gold with the one and only Andrew McGuire. Welcome to Live from the Vault. Hi there, my name is Shane Moran, and I'll be your host for this week's episode of Live from the Vault. So welcome to the show that goes beyond the headlines and uncovers the truth about the precious metals industry and the effects on the global economy in these historic times. With exclusive access to experts and insiders, we reveal information and insights that you simply won't find anywhere else. Now this week, we have the one and only Andrew McGuire, precious metals expert and whistleblower in the vault. And to help him pull back the curtain, we'll be joined by a first-time guest in the vault and by popular demand. That's you, our Live from the Vault community, Lynette Zhang. That's right, Lynette Zhang is in the vault. And you're, again, not going to want to miss this conversation with Andrew McGuire. So just before we introduce our special guest here and head over to the UK, please help keep spreading the word about this channel by hitting that like button right now. Just hit the like button Share this information and be sure to subscribe if you haven't already done so and click on the bell and we'll notify you as each and every episode goes live. So let me, for those that don't know Lynette, let me give you a quick introduction. Ms. Zhang has uh, been in markets, I guess, at some level from 1964 and she's been a banker, she's been a stockbroker, she studied world currencies since 1987 and with that, Let's head over to the UK and talking gold with the one and only Andrew McGuire and our special guest, Lynette Zhang. Over to you, Andy. Welcome, Lynette. It's so nice to have you join us. I know a little bit about you. I, I certainly know we're all coming from exactly the same place. And um, it is it is really a privilege to have you on board. I know you do a load of good work. and um, And it's all about, as we were just saying, it's it's all about education and enabling people to really take responsibility for themselves with better information and to make wise decisions based upon more information. So thank you for sharing uh, your time with us. Well, it, it is really an honor for me to be here. So thank you for having me here. And you have a, uh, a new um, a new website and you uh, understand a new, you've launched a new um uh, website. I know you've got some really big names in there, and um, I would certainly encourage people to check it out. I have checked it out myself, um, and there's a ton of good information in there, and uh, we really strongly suggest people do uh, come in and uh, and land and get some, and they can get personal advice if they want to by the looks of it. So, yes, absolutely, because we do pay a lot of attention and. You are right. This is a brand new YouTube channel, brand new site, uh, but I have been doing this on some level since 1964, which is why I said, you can ask me anything. If I don't know my stuff by now, <laughs> then I'm in deep trouble. But I've personally been, you know, a banker, a stockbroker and studying currency life cycles since 1987 and that's critical since that's what's happening right now we're at the end of this fiat money's life cycle yeah that's so interesting i i was listening to that that uh you 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 brought raised that into i think one of your recent episodes and and you were talking about the debt paced fiat financial system how it died in 2008 and and how you know we're talking about history uh you're talking about how you were looking, connecting history, and how this actually proved uh, you, how it really just was another instance of when one system dies, another will be born, is how you put it, um, and how this reset is going to be catastrophic. So, so this is all the more information that it's all the more reason people um, should pay attention to the the kind of experience you bring. Um, to you know, to, to, you know, to the table here, um, and there's not everywhere that you can get that kind of information. So, um, you know, maybe you can we could talk about a bit about, you know, what what is it that you're seeing right now? Obviously, I know that you have a global view, but I'm also really interested in what's happening your side of the pond, um, and because obviously we have a a, a Fed 
who is really kind of calling a lot of shots globally. Um, where are we um, the, the, with the failure of the dollar? Um, you know, wh- where are we with this failing dollar? Well, you know, the, the dollar is the best looking horse in the glue factory, maybe. But, you know, really to your point, since the U.S. dollar is the world reserve currency, which is not really true anymore, but it's still referred to as that, uh, that gives the Fed a lot of power. And because so many countries around the world are tethered to the dollar in one way or another, some countries are even using the dollar instead of their currency because their currency is hyperinflated away and lost all the confidence. What's going to end up happening is these, those that have chosen to adopt the dollar, including U.S. citizens, are going to be quite shocked as the dollar's demise looms. Now, now let me just say this. They know how to do this. They know how to make the transition from one currency to another currency and make it as invisibly as possible. You know, to your point, I was there in 1971 when President Nixon handed over control of inflation to central banks because that's really what happened when he took us off the gold standard temporarily, which of course we're still off because what do bankers know? They know debt and they know interest rates. And so what tool in a debt-based system, how do you justify or how do you grow the money base? Will you loan it into existence? And every time the Federal Reserve does that, the money or any central bank, this is not just the U.S., but the money that's already out there loses value. That's called inflation. And there are advantages to inflation for governments because they get to tax you without going through legislation. So therefore keeping it almost invisible. And then for corporations, even though nominally, so numerically, they it seems like they're paying you more and more, that dollar out there buys you less and less. So that in 1971, with an average wage of $9,500, a family of four needed one wage earner. Today, you know, you're $150,000 a a year and you're paycheck to paycheck, even at $250,000 a year. And they stimulated anybody under $150,000. So what that really tells you is how much value the dollar has lost. Even look at the stock market with these trillion and two trillion and three trillion dollar companies. Is it really that that company is worth that much money or is it that the dollar has lost that much value, which is really a much more accurate statement? Yes. And of course, that brings us on to the the ultimate benchmark, gold being money for 5,000 odd years And yes, exactly. And that's the benchmark. And and I think that, so really, um, as a a sense, you know, really these days, what you're looking at is, I think central banks, I'm looking at central banks here, from the European side of things, we're looking at um, perhaps as a percentage of GDP, the average European bank, and, and, you know, it was roughly maybe around the 4% backing their GDP by about 4%. What was really interesting, I really want to ask you about this because um, I saw a Bloomberg piece a few months ago by uh, your ex-Treasury Secretary, Setster, Setster, his name was, um, and uh, official. And um, what he said was, and this is really interesting because this segues into, um, uh, you know, what percentage does China, Russia have to back their currencies? (laughs) <laughs> and, and I think what's as interesting is he said, one of the things he, he was raised a concern, and this was on Bloomberg, and he raised a concern that China has 3.4 trillion, in addition to the 3.4 trillion of FX reserves that, that sit on their balance sheet, they, that he, his concern was there's another 3.4 trillion of shadow banking reserves that are salted amongst the 
the um, state-held banks. Well, this kind of solved the problem because how did – and we have very, very close relationships with our liquidity providers and very good contacts, China, Russia. Um, and interestingly, um, they've all along said, look, conservatively – you can pick any number, but conservatively – in their opinion, because monetary gold doesn't have to be reported. Yes. Obviously, we look at what is officially stated, but monetary gold, it, it, of course, it doesn't have to be reported. And they figure that a good portion of this 3.4 trillion has been converted to, into physical gold, which is salted amongst these banks, the state held banks, and could be clicked at any time. Yes. And, and I think that essentially, if that is the case, and I'm saying they believe it's the case. And they're well connected. That could essentially mean that their their currencies are back. The China's currency is backed up to forty uh, percent of as a percentage of GDP. If this is the case, so I think this is this is an interesting dynamic here because in the bigger picture, and we're always looking at gold as the benchmark for to valuing currencies. Right, and of course Europe four percent. Suddenly you've got central banks, the Sino-Russian alliance. And, it, and Russia probably twenty thousand tons, with sixty thousand tons of gold to back what they plan is one day the nuclear option for them isn't war; it's revaluing gold. And so, what, what's your what's your thoughts about this? Well, for one thing, all central banks have a gold revaluation account. Yes, and the excuse that they use or that that um, people have heard is that, well, there's not enough gold to back a currency. Well, that's simply not true. All they have to do is what they always do, which is revalue the gold, suppress it while it supports their efforts so people, individuals stay away from it. But then when all confidence is lost, then all they have to do is revalue it. So there's that, that is the whole point of gold, that there is a finite amount and it has the broadest base of functionality since it's used in every single sector of the global economy, you know, bar none. And um, so it actually makes it pretty simple. But talking about China just a little bit more, China enabled their and encouraged their citizens to start to accumulate gold, but hold it inside of their banking system. So what do they really have access to? Because if anybody thinks that the Chinese government wouldn't take public gold for their benefit, they need to think again. And what they know, what many countries know, since we've seen central banks buy the most gold that they ever have since they started recording it historically, is they're quite clear that this is the end of, you know, whether you're the euro, the yen or anything else, this is the end of this debt-based system. But in order to go into the new system, which if they have their druthers is a full surveillance CBDC, that is not my druther, but um, in order to do that, something I've had a really hard time finding, so I don't know that they've fully defined it yet, is in the current system, money's created from debt. What's going to create, what's going to justify creating the new money in the new system? I, I've seen them discuss debt, which means they got to wipe out through hyperinflation. They're all defaulting. I don't care what country you're looking at. They have no choice. They have to get rid of the debt. And the way that developed nations do that is through hyperinflation. So whoever's holding those debt instruments or, you know, stocks, bonds, things that can only be annuities, things that can only be converted into this, when it loses all purchasing power, you Look at Zimbabwe. You could have to be a billionaire and not be able to buy three eggs, right? It's hard for people to wrap their brain around because what they like to do is just keep the same name. So a lot of people think nothing has changed when in reality, everything has changed. But at the end of the day, because of its many uses, not only is the broadest functionality, but it has the broadest base of buyer. That's why it's never gone to zero. Yeah, yeah. And this is this is this is so interesting because it's it changes. You're talking about the 
everything changing. Every, I talk about this reset is going to be, as you said, it's going to be uh, pretty dramatic. Andy, look at what's happened. Look at what's happened since, let's say, September of 2019. Yeah. And then if you go back a little further, look at what happened in 2007. So this change is frankly not something that I'm waiting for. It's something that I'm watching evolve. And having studied currencies forever, you see these repeatable patterns. And these patterns tell you where we are in this trend cycle. I mean, I'm never going to get you to the exact day or moment. But, you know, when you see the same thing that has happened, and it's happened over 4,800 times, 100% of the time, and we're doing the same thing, you know, what, what they always say is this time is different. But the reality is, is this time is not any different. And so you really have an opportunity in the suppression to buy gold severely undervalued and silver too. I like silver for barterability and gold for uh, wealth preservation. There are different uses for mm. different things, but just to stay general, you know, at this point, um, you know, there are opportunities. This is a wealth transfer mechanism. Inflation is a wealth transfer transfer mechanism. Stock markets imploding are a wealth transfer mechanism. And, you know, that's why since we've been on a pure debt system, that's really what's enabled the income and wealth and equality. But we can take advantage of these things that we cannot change. We can vote with our wallets, right? And have sound money outside of the system, and that presents the opportunity when they do reset the currency. Because right now you have all of these assets that are based on this up at nosebleed valuation levels. And you have gold because a rise in gold price is an indication of a failing currency. You have that severely undervalued. Well, that's going to flip flop. So whoever then holds this gold is going to be able to retain their freedom, their choices, and their opportunities. Well, why should it only be the elite? We can do it too and take advantage of what they've set up for us. Absolutely. And, and I think this is such an important message. Now, I think one of the things that always amazed me, Lynette, and, and obviously uh, this is something that you are countering now, is that over the years, um, there have been obviously around a lot, lot of years in, in, in the wholesale markets and and as you know, whistleblower and, and done all done my bit to, stuff. To, yes. to do all that kind of stuff. But essentially, one thing that's always amazed me is how few Americans, how few U.S. citizens, have actually chosen to do what you're talking about here, which is what the message you're sending. Very important message. Now, in Europe, I mean, goodness me, we, we have vaults in, uh, in 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 Liechtenstein. We have we we are we're connected with a lot of Germans and Swiss. And and it's it's a no brainer. Um, even today, um, the average German will have a savings account where his wages go into into a gold savings account. It's it's never been forgotten. Um, hyperinflation has never been forgotten. Um, but the amazing thing to me was I always thought when, when there's a gold revaluation, I look to India, and I look at the and, and I sometimes I just have this this vision because I've been there multiple times. There's a a, 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 you know, a, a farmer on a on a bicycle down, going down a dusty little path. He's got his gold coin, which he's going to trade with at, at, at the market. Um, he owns kilos of gold, literally kilos of gold through dowries and, and one thing and another. It, it's not for sale; it is there. Now, what happens when the, if there was a gold revaluation today, and say the average American has the jewelry on their hands? or maybe an ounce or two in right. jewelry, what kind of a wealth transfer would there be when you suddenly say if gold is valued $3,000, $5,000 an ounce, um, well, and which is not unthinkable. I mean, these, these, are, these are conservative numbers. So I'm going to ask you about that in a minute. But, but essentially, that would put, that would be a wealth transfer where you have the average, average Indian farmer or Indian rural farmer far more wealthy than anybody in America. This is a strange dynamic to me. It is a very strange dynamic. But, you know, in 1982, then President Reagan 
brought over Rupert Murdoch from the from where you are from the UK. Yes, and uh, changed the rules and created officially a perception management program, and it employs the most brilliant psychological minds in the world. So because if they can manage how you perceive things, mm. then in essence, they're getting you to volunteer your work, your wealth, your freedom, your everything. And so I think that the reason why the average American doesn't realize any of this, I mean, honestly, had I not become a stockbroker at Shearson in the 80s, and then when you could actually talk to the head of any trading desk, mm. today I think that's impossible. But back then... You know, I stumbled across non-dollar denominated bonds and I was like, huh, you know, wow, there was a five year triple A piece of paper that was yielding 12 and three quarters percent. And I thought, well, that's pretty amazing. You know, so I had to start studying currencies. So what did I do? I called up the head of currency trading at Shearson and every day for about a year and a half or so. That was my very first call of the day. We would discuss everything. And then at night, you know, she would give me my homework and I would, you know, study, study, study. And then the next morning we would go over it. If I hadn't stumbled across that, I would not understand currency life cycles. America is a relatively new country. And even though we experienced the depression and we have Previously in the Civil War, the War of 1812, the Spanish-American War, we have had hyperinflation in this country. Um, that's so far away that most people, it's just way too far. And it's not really, and it's the way that these things are taught in schools mm. are about training how you think about them. So, yeah, I mean, I'm trying to reach as many people and simplify this. I mean, my mission is to translate financial noise into understandable language so that people can do their own due diligence. That's why I always like to give all the links. Don't take my word for it, but don't take anybody's words for it. Yeah. Here's the data. If you have a different opinion than me, I cannot tell you that your opinion is less valid than mine. If you don't do your due diligence and you just have a random opinion, well, then, yeah, it's it's not as valid as mine because mine is an educated opinion. But I want everybody to have that educated opinion so that they can do what puts their families and their best interests first. Nobody's going to be impacted like the individual, like that family. You know, J.P. Morgan for the government may be too big to fail, but for my family... I'm too big to fail, right? You see what I'm saying? I mean, you know, there's a social side to this too, because quite honestly, this is this is what this is important because these messages are so important. And I think, um, you know, it's this isn't about making money. It's about first and foremost wealth preservation. Yes, all the hard energy, work, time that you've put in, your families have put in, um, are being taken away um, stealthily from you and you do need to take this is why it's important people listen and say i do have a way of taking but yeah, how do i take responsibility for myself how do i do that i'm overwhelmed well it's simple it's right in front of us the solution is right in front of us and i think this is why i think it's so important the message that you are talking and you're talking about you can talk about every aspect of it mm -hmm. it, it to keep it really simple People have the choice of actually taking their debasing. Their obviously, you just showed that the, the money printer there. I mean, right. every time they you do that, every time they do that, it's not that gold is going up in price. It's just costing more pounds, dollars, euros, yen to buy the same piece of gold that's bought the same amount for five thousand years. And I think this is a hard thing to get across to people. It is, but you do a great job with it. I'm doing my job with it. I mean, there are a lot of really wonderful and talented people out there. We are a community. And I've, you know, really come to realize 
uh, even though, you know, I mean, I developed my mantra because there was no doubt in my mind in 2008 that the system died. And I was actually getting ready to retire. I was in a little two bedroom condo that I could just lock the door <laughs> and off I go. And then 2008 happened, which I did not think I would see in my lifetime. Mm -hmm. And when that happened, instead, I bought a property and I am in dead central Phoenix. Now, I do subsequently have a bug out property, but I am in dead central Phoenix and I and I am not a gardener by nature or, you know, a farmer or whatever I am now um, because I know that food becomes the single biggest issue for most people. And look around the world and look at what's happening with the farmers. Yeah. You know, uh, uh, globally, you were talking about the Indian farmer and He's in a pretty good position, let me tell you, because he's got food, water, energy, security, barterability, wealth, preservation, community, and shelter. In the U.S., you know, it's definitely more disjointed than that. I mean, a lot of people have no idea who their neighbors are, right? They go to the grocery store. They think they can always go to the grocery store, even though these days, you know, there's just a... a they, they put a row right up in front so it looks like the shelf is full. But if you pull something down, there's nothing behind it. Wow. You know, and I think that we can all remember when it was really challenging 2020 to get the food from the grocery store. Yeah. I'm walking around my property because I have become an urban farmer. Um, and I'm going, oh, look at look at how smart I am, right? Right. Because I had plenty of food. I had toilet paper that I could share. I mean, you know, I was able to take care of my family and lots of people, actually. But there were riots near my home at the Capitol and near where my children live, which is not that far from me, but a very nice area in Phoenix, Scottsdale. Some of your viewers may be familiar with it in Paradise Valley. Yeah. And yeah there I were am. riots in these two key places. And that night, I slept in bed with a gun. Wow. And I thought, this is no way to live. This is not. So I even saw the hole in my own preparations and have subsequently plugged that hole by it's very, very, it's very, 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 very remote and it's completely off grid. So up there, I can be very independent and ultimately very self-sufficient. And I'm actually building a community for that can house 40 people and maintain food and everything like that because it takes a village. But what people need to understand too is, you know, I started this journey right after 2008. So I've had all of this time to learn my lessons on how to do this stuff. We don't have that luxury of time anymore. And so what I've come to really understand is that, yes, everything is held together with sound money, right? Glued together with gold and silver. However, we need all of those parts. We need to come together in a local community to make sure that we can feed our family, have water, have all those mantra pieces. But on a global basis, because we're all in this together, I don't care where you are, we are all in this together. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Vote with our wallets. We vote with our purses. If you if you vote by keeping your wealth inside the system that you can only convert into this, when this goes to zero, what do you have? You have nothing, right? But on the flip side of that, this is fiat money. This is sound money. If we all bought some gold, even if even if a very vocal three percent of the public of the population bought gold. Yeah. And they wanted to cram that surveillance money down our throats, so CBDCs, and we had food, we had security in all those areas, food, water, energy, security, barterability, wealth preservation, community, and shelter. Then we have the option to say no. If you're dependent on them, how can you say no? You have to do whatever they want you to do. That's powerful. That's a powerful message. And I think people should take note because, as you say, there's, this is the, it's happening. It's happening. And I think we will look back in the rearview mirror at this year, this actual 2024 year, and say, 
my goodness me, it'll be almost like the people who I wish they got in at Bitcoin when it was a penny I, I, and and regret the day they didn't. And in the rear view mirror, they're, 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 they're not unhappy about it. Here it is, here and now. You can buy silver at, at an incredible discount. You can buy gold and it's grossly undervalued. And you can exchange your depreciating dollars today, tomorrow, at and, and come to see you or somebody and just simply do it and swap those depreciating dollars. And then you've now taken the first step to actually financial freedom. And as you say, the rest of it is very important too, because you just also mentioned the social side of this. It, it, we are all in this together. And, and we need to we need to make sure that our neighbor is doing okay as well. And this is why it's so important to for these channels, like our channel, your channel, yes. exactly, to put that net out a little bit wiser. And then and somebody else will look at it and say, they'll go home and they'll speak to, you know, Grandma Grimble and say, hey, you know what I mean? It's like it'll it, it, it gets out there. Oh, right. Okay. I, I remember that when we used to be able to take responsibility for ourselves and we've been gaslighted, gaslighted in this woke world into not we, but many, many people have been gaslighted into thinking that, well, big brother, you can tell us what to do and, and we'll just follow along. You know, you've got our good interests at heart. Yeah? Yes. Well, I don't know. Maybe I'm naive, but I think that um, more and more people are seeing that they don't have our best interests at heart. And something that really um, gives me a lot of hope is that I'm seeing more and more younger people gravitating to this message. I mean, they realize in this country and actually in China, I mean, this is happening all over the world. The younger generations are realizing the lies that they believed. I mean, the American lie was that if you follow the rules and you work hard and you get a good education, you're going to be able to have a family, buy a home, educate your children, retire, or you can reach that, that height that if you just work hard. But so many of the young people, they don't expect to ever be able to be able to buy a house, Right. Uh, they don't, no matter how hard they work, they're saddled with student debt and credit card debt and all sorts of debt. They're never going to get ahead. And so the good part about that is that they see the illusion and they're starting to pay attention just a little different. And, and I, that's what gives me like, that's what gives me a lot of hope. That's what gives me a tremendous amount of hope because it's not the old people. <laughs> like like me, that's going to lead this revolution. It's the younger generation that have grown up with all this technology that are more comfortable with giving up their privacy. They've been trained that ha, ah, who needs privacy? Mm. You know, I'm I'm still in a generation where I like some privacy. Right? I like that privacy. Um, but I do have a lot of hope because I can see a movement happening in the younger generation, and that's that's what's going to save us. And and those that can't afford uh, to buy even a gram of gold, um, you could actually buy an ounce of silver, two ounces of silver, perhaps. You can, but you know what I have here, Andy? I have a whole bunch of sterling silver chopsticks, yes, iced teaspoons, right? These are 92.5% pure. Yep. Mexican silver, 92.5% pure. Do I care that it's tarnished? Do I care that it's bent <laughs> or broken? Heck, no, I don't. I, uh, you know, gosh, I used to be able to get this and at so many yard sales for nothing because people would say, oh, I don't want to polish it. Oh, I'll buy it for nothing. <laughs> right? So my point is for those people that that um, don't feel that they can buy a gram of gold or even an ounce of silver, right? There's always a way to accumulate. You might have some sterling silver or 925 silver in your jewelry box. You might have, you know, Aunt Bessie's 
salt and pepper shakers, right? A picture frame, a chopstick, a, a ladle, you know, so, and you might be able to find them. Like I haven't done this in a while, but I did for a long time. I'd go to yard sales and buy the stuff. Dude. I'd go to, to, you know, like Salvation Army, different places where they donate stuff. Now people recognize it more, but gold and silver in any form is monetary at its base and it does not matter what the condition is. So there's always a way to accumulate or become part of a cu- of a community. Maybe you can lay irrigation and I have the silver for barterability. You see? So we all bring together. That's what a community does. They all bring together their talents and what they have and they share it amongst everybody so that everybody gets supported. Yeah, and it's accessible to everyone. And I think, oh, goodness me, at 12 years old, I used to go to auctions and buy silver. Why? Just just because because it, it was shiny and because I liked it. And the thing is, it, it's, it's as you say, it, doesn't, it just doesn't matter. The point is, it is silver is accessible to everyone. You've just described some ways. And in fact, I bet you, if you went into auction, some auction houses in America in various places, I bet you any money you could get silver below spot and, and, and there's no taxes available. So, I mean, it's there. It, and, I, you know, it's something that people should do. But, but I think what is also interesting, I think, is that you mentioned sound money. Well, some states in, in your country now, um, actually shifted to actually the states themselves promoting uh, sound money. Yes. Is there so- something you can tell us about that, 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 any updates, what's happening? Well, you know, every, there are a number of states. I think uh, last time I checked, about 11 states had legalized gold and silver as money again. Yeah. So that is always the first step. And then um, through Congress you'll typically have somebody come out and and propose a bill, again, making, you know, a sound money bill. And then, of course, it just kind of, my good friend and I just admire him so much, Ron Paul. Um, You know, he fought forever to get sound money back into the system. Mm. Uh, So there's always progress. And Texas, of course, has opened up a huge vault uh, to house their gold, uh, et cetera. And, and I think individuals can also put gold there. So it is a movement that is growing, um, but, you know, it, it takes a village. It takes, it takes as many people as possible participating because if we're all buying gold and silver, this is the only gold, is the only financial asset that runs no counterparty risk. This is what you're voting for. This is what I'm voting for because I have children and grandchildren and great grandchildren. And I would like on the other side of this reset, because we got to go through the reset. That's just, we got to go through it. What gold and silver and all those other parts of the mantra do is they enable you to sustain inside of a community, especially sustain a reasonable standard of living. Because everybody's going to be impacted. I don't care what you've got. There will be an impact. Mm. But you have a choice right now on how how hard you're going to be impacted or not, or will there be opportunities? So the first part of the strategy really always is about sustaining a reasonable standard of living. And then, to your point, because these are so severely undervalued, and this is what they do is they do this revaluation against gold and then gold shoots near its fundamental value, which, by the way, I would say is I've got to check on this, but it's somewhere north of 15,000. And, and that may sound crazy. No, it doesn't. But yeah. It, yeah. But if, if you went back to 1900 and, and told that person with this $20 gold coin that someday <laughs> this was going to be you know, valued in the market at over $2,000, they would have thought you were crazy then too, right? Um, But we have this opportunity. So first you want to sustain your standard of living. Then you want to protect the wealth that you're holding inside of the markets that you may not have any choice or you may decide you want to leave in there too. That's up to you. 
So you want to be properly diversified. Stocks and bonds are all this. You're not diversified. I don't care what they say. Yeah. This can diversify you. So if this goes to zero, you're still protected. And then you want to be in a position to take advantage of what's happening. Because all those income producing severely overvalued fiat money assets now is going to wash away. We're going to see who's going to survive, but we'll have a better vision to see, okay, what do I need to convert into to generate income that I cannot outlive yeah. and can even, dare I say it, pass down to my heirs. Though I will say, one advantage that we have in America that you don't really have in most of the rest of the world is we can do a 30-year fixed mortgage. Whereas in other parts of the world, maybe it's two years, maybe it's five years, maybe it's 10 years. But that means that you kind of, if you, if you cannot pay that mortgage off, then you're subject to all that interest rate abuse and that can become a problem with the affordability of where you're already living and have put a lot of years in. Yeah. So in the U.S., that is like a tremendous advantage because that's all part of the strategy on paying that stuff off. And it could be elsewhere too. You just have a much shorter time horizon on that. And, and having no faith in in the, 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 the financial system, a broken financial system. Um, so obviously we have to connect the dots and say, well, there will be a day when um, you will need, you use Zimbabwe as a perfect example. You have that paper, paper dollar and you think, well, hang on, I, I need some bread. I need some eggs. I need some basics. Uh, now, so when, you, when you've when you loaded your wheelbar wheelbarrow full app of, of paper notes, and then even as you're going there, they've again depreciated, um, then it brings you back to what gold is and what silver is. And what it is, is, is really in simple terms, that I've often explained to people, that all the energy that was ever, ever created, that were, were from digging it out the ground, producing it, and and creating that bar or coin is in it it's in it it is no long there's no counter as you say no counterparty risk it's there now when people when when the banking system when you see the when you see that the, the amount of money printing that goes goes on it's a no-brainer then you would think well hold on a minute well if i need to um actually survive this financial um Armageddon that is coming essentially. Um, so what I need to do is have something that had, that creates because all the energy is in it. That has created a barter tool, the ultimate barter tool, because I can now value a chicken. I can value your labor in digging a trench for me. I can value that. Um, it's a global valuation, and it's one aggregated global aggregation. And it will create equality. So it's amazing to me that people don't get this simple. Well, people do, but I think that so many people don't. Well, we have to teach them, which is what you do and what I try and do, right? Because they've been indoctrinated in the ways that the government, that supports what the government and the central bankers want. So, you know, what we're asking people to do is have a paradigm shift and except the fact that they have been lied to since the day they were born, which is something that is very hard for most people to do. It is. And we have to have empathy for them and prepare for them. When I first did this urban farm, all I was really trying to do was create enough food for 20 people because that's how many were in my uh, immediate family. But subsequently... I think I can feed at least 100 people here now. And up north, even though I'm saying 40 people, I think by the time we're done, we will be able to, to feed a whole lot more people. So I think it's critically important that we lead with our actions, which is what I know you do and what I attempt to do, you know, all the time. And then as people get, you know, people know things aren't right. 
the point that you brought up with the energy is like so real. And I was talking to my sister about this the other day. Um, we, we used to hike and remember 9-11 when those planes fl- flew in, right? Nice. And we had been yeah. hiking that morning and we weren't listening to the news. Nothing. We're in the middle of nowhere. And when I got back to my car or as I was hiking back to my car, it's like the air just felt weird. It just, it felt surreal. Yeah. And then when I got in the car and I turned on the radio, that's when I found out. So energy travels. It really does. And when you're looking at physical gold and physical silver, because it's used in every area, the other part is that it has the broadest functionality of any financial asset. You know, all the rest are used in one place. It's used in every place, right? And therefore, it has the broadest base of fire, right? So if this buyer goes away over here, you've got this buyer over here. And that same thing cannot be said for these fiat money assets. And if people can understand that piece, just supply and demand, which has also been trained out of us with all of these derivatives and the options and all, which is a derivative and all these things um, allowing share buybacks to make it look like the stock is going up as the insiders are selling, but the public doesn't know that, and they get FOMO, fear of missing out. I mean, it's it's all of these legalized manipulations to push people in the direction that benefits the elites. And, and I think what you and I are trying to do is open their eyes, have them look at things. Like I, I started doing these just five-minute shareable videos. And those videos are really about simplifying it all the way down for those people that are going la, 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 la. I don't want to see it. I don't want to hear it. I don't want to believe it. Just trying to get them to just open their minds a teeny weeny bit, just a teeny weeny bit. Because I've discovered in my lifetime that when I look at something just a little differently, it is amazing what you see. Oh, absolutely. And and I think what we're, do, what we're essentially saying is, look, here's a way of pushing back. Here's a way of actually um, having the power to push back because without gold, silver, you will not have it. And, and, and yet, look across the globe. Look at the BRICS countries. Look at these people, that, that, that these, these nations, which actually control probably 80% of all the commodities, are now looking at valuing commodities in gold terms and have the sufficient gold accrued to be able to um, to create um, currencies, uh, commodity currencies that are based on gold. Now, if that happens or when that happens, it's going to happen, um, um, uh, uh, then basically what's going to happen is if you price oil in gold, for example, and you have a big enough market that accepts gold as oil, then if you try and buy that oil oil in dollars, the inflationary aspect of that, because really when you start to use gold as as, as the benchmark for, and what you're doing is is creating real value for oil, for grain, for all the things, because it's not diluted, it's the real value. And, And so really suddenly the inflationary aspect that would kick back against people who are having to buy oil in dollars still is enormous. And I think people need to understand this is coming. Well, it's, it's, it's already evolving. Now, the one concern when we talk about, I mean, I really like the um, digitization part and valuing things in terms of gold. I think that's really important. Um, but what I think is equally important maybe even a little more important than that is the ability to convert. So in Zimbabwe, what, a year, year and a half ago, they issued one ounce gold coins, which of course only the elites could afford. But now they have a gold backed digital currency, but it hasn't been doing great because the public doesn't trust it It because you cannot convert it. That's the key. That's the key. You've got to be able to convert it. So I don't care who says, 
Our currency is a commodity currency backed by gold. If you can't convert it, how do you believe it? You can't. I mean, that's what we did here in the U.S. You know, in the beginning, you could convert. You could walk into any bank with this and walk out with this. Yep. That created restrictions around what governments could do. Well, they took that ability away from the public in 33. Now is no longer convertible. So the public really lost all of their power at that point. But other countries could still convert it. And there was definitely a run on the dollar when, when you know, people realized, when countries realized that we were abusing our the world reserve status. There was a run on the dollar in the 60s. We had less gold in our coffers than we did prior to the confiscation in 33. And that's when Nixon completely, well, disallowed other governments from converting their dollars into gold. And then what? You're, you're going to convert this into what? Debt? It's already debt. <laughs> yeah. And you're working for debt? And it's no coincidence, Lynette, it's no coincidence, is it, that um, that uh, after uh, August 71, you, you talked about Nixon and the convertibility of gold to dollar soup, and for obvious reasons. Um, and then it's no coincidence, though, in December 1974, the COMEX rose. In, or rather, the, co- the existing COMEX allowed the trading of gold. And really, and at the time, it was openly discussed. And it, the minutes are all there. Well, we can create volatility. We can create any amount of... Uh, we can control the gold price and stop, as you say, stop central banks, foreign central banks, from coming in and converting their, their, their various their, their dollars back into gold. And we've had that for 50 years. We have. And let me add something to that, Andrew, that that not a lot of people know, but I find completely fascinating. I don't remember whether it was 1964 or 1965. It's one of those years Mm. where they actually came out and legalized a gold certificate. Mm. Now, you couldn't at that point convert it into gold. But who do you think knew about that gold certificate but the elites that created it, and now, to your point, they come out with the COMEX exchange and they allow it to run to 825 intraday. And who was sitting on those gold contracts that after 1986, you could actually convert, right? I mean, this is all a setup, but I mean, I thought when I found that that it was in 1964, 1965, that they legalized gold certificates. Because I used to listen to my Uncle Al, who was very instrumental in, you know, my education and how hard assets, how tangible assets work. And, you know, my parents, they never, they talked about a lot of stuff. I learned a tremendous amount from them, but they never talked about the gold certificates. And my Uncle Al was very into gold because he'd go into these wealthy homes And, you know, he showed me two tall floor safes where you could not fit one more ounce of gold in there, period. You could not fit it. Mm. He had, that was when it was illegal to hold more than five ounces of gold. And here he had at least 3,000 ounces of gold (laughs) that he could use in the normal marketplace. Yeah. I didn't understand it then. I was only 10 when he showed them to me. Well, one day I was writing and I said, well, if you were alive like I was in 1971, and then I and then I realized what he was showing me. It was like a light bulb went off and I went, holy cow. Yeah, that, that's why I like getting older. I love the experience. Well, this is it. And 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 so it became a tool uh, of the um of the Fed, of the officials to um, you know, to protect dollar hegemony is to to literally try to value the real value of dollar as you say you've you've already and, and you've you've I've looked on your site and you you talk about how it's lost 97% of all its purchasing power since then and and so really i mean all those things hit you right in the eye yeah so so what i think what was interesting was that when when covid hit in 2020 now from speaking from the wholesale side perspective um what happened was in March 2020, um, we suddenly saw 
the refineries, our, our Swiss refiners, our gold refiners, our, our, our Swiss refiners, Europe refiners all shut down overnight. Suddenly no supply. And yet all of the paper gold out there suddenly, and, and we and our liquidity providers were still providing long FX gold contracts. And so everyone turned around and said, hey, there's no physical. Let's have delivery of that, please. And suddenly, panic, panic. Yes. Oh, hang on a minute. We've got that hedged on the COMEX as a short hedge against our long FX gold position. Only problem is, due to leverage, suddenly, and, and you've got 96% of leverage on each of those gold shorts versus the, it, literally you only need to 4% to control it. Right. And what happened is suddenly... Why did the why did the bid only market to cover your short hedges go to ninety six percent higher, i.e. a hundred dollar spreads between the actual bid bid and the ask, and and it is because it suddenly exposed the extent of the the degree of leverage of paper market leverage out there, and that was the exact moment that the Bank of International Settlements realized that this daisy chain of banks that that literally one goes like Lehman, one goes, a lot go, um, they were and they're exposed to uh, yes, it's 15 trillion a year FX markets, but it's 75 trillion if you add in all the derivatives. One of those guys goes, the whole system implodes. And so what that was the exact moment the Bank of International Settlement said we're bringing in Basel III NSFR standards to to kick in on the first of uh, January 2022, which happened. So suddenly gold became valued as a first year asset class that trades alongside US treasuries. Manna from heaven, from every other central bank globally, they come to the COMEX, they take the EF, what's called the EFP backdoor. Thank you. We'll alchemize your gold. And funnily enough, when it was, there was 800,000 contracts, pretty close to 800,000 contracts. Open on my, in, I still open at March 2022. The exact apex point when it's now reduced this week to 40,000 tons, from 80,000 tons to 40,000 tons. So, where did all this open interest go? Well, it's it's just these guys are bailing out, and and one has to realize that we've changed that this whole market's changed. And what's what I felt was really interesting than that is that suddenly the Bitcoin ETF launches. Uh, uh, it, a weeks ago or a month ago, and suddenly we got open interest over a trillion dollar valuation in the Bitcoin ETF. We see three trillion, three billion exiting the gold ETF, four to five trillion entering the Bitcoin ETF. Good riddance, I say. These guys, these FOMO chasers, are exiting the very market that the Fed and the and the manipulators rely on to control the price. They're now going to have to focus on the, um, the the new foe to the dollar, which is Bitcoin. Good riddance, because we're going to get a real physical price evolve. Well, I I I hope you're right about. I, at some point, you're right. We are going to. But let's since you brought up Bitcoin, because I've been watching Bitcoin since it was seven dollars a coin. So I've been watching it pretty close to since its inception. Personally. I do not think it was a coincidence that Bitcoin launched in January of 2009 and quantitative easing launched in March of 2009. <laughs> and I don't think that, you know, reading the NSA white paper from 19, what, 96 about how to make a mint. Can you imagine had Bitcoin not come out, how much more of this fiat crap would have actually gone into physical gold and physical silver. Yep. So could that not be one? I mean, it was a tool of, of look over here and do this, right? But um, also a tool to get people used to the digital currencies, right? Because that's how they do that. That's how they make that transfer is, is they want it to be as normal or seem as normal normal as possible yeah i know there are a lot of people that would like me to feel differently and um about cryptocurrencies and 
uh, the, the reality is, is you have to show me what their functionality is. Yeah, no, it's good. And it's so important to question everything. And this is the point in a day when we're supposed to accept the narrative, all the mainstream media, one narrative about everything, whether it's a war, whether it doesn't matter what it is, it's the same narrative. This is the joy of these sessions. We question things. Yes. And, and it's okay to question stuff. And if it gets people thinking, maybe wrong, maybe right, but I'm going to make a decision based upon all of these inf bits of information. And what you're, see, what you're saying, Lynette, is it's an algorithm of all your experience is saying to you, it is. I don't trust this. I'm not convinced about something, yet I am convinced about something else. And it's like, People have to respect that because it is a huge, huge resource um, which can, which we should all and share amongst each other and share that experience and say, and then carry on this discussion elsewhere, in the pub, wherever it might be. And I think, um, I think, I really want to thank you for joining us today. Um, and I know that we've 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 taken an hour of your good time here. And, and people start tuning out after an hour, even if you are the brightest and, and <laughs> we're the brightest. Or the, but it, it really it really was honestly a blast to have you join us. I mean, you please, I want you to come and join us again and connect some more dots. I think I have to come and do that in person. Yeah, sure. Absolutely. You, you know, I was lucky enough to have a semester in England when I was in college in Roxton, which is outside of Cambridge, outside of Banbury. Yeah. Absolutely fell in love with it. Have been back a few times since, but uh, this next time, I think we have to do this in person. How about that? There's a deal. <laughs> and and we I will be heading to, to see my friends in Texas soon. And so you're just a hop across the border. So we'd love to come and uh, share a beer with you and um, talk about some of this stuff. Oh, absolutely. And I, I think you will be rather gobsmacked with, if you come to the urban farm. <laughs> okay. Love it. Okay. Well, thank you so much, Lynette. I really appreciate uh, what well, we really appreciate. All our subscribers are going to appreciate this. It's a wealth of knowledge. And um, I really do encourage people Hit, hit that link to come and visit your site. It's a new channel. Um, support it. Um, let's get a real movement going here. That's, it's not, there's a social side to this. I really get that. So um, I think people want, will want to, to, to come at least and drop in and see what, what they can draw from you. So I certainly hope so because we really are, uh, even though this is a new YouTube channel, I've been doing this for a very, very long time. Yeah. And I really have realized that I need to go global. We need to build a community so that we can retain. Uh, you know, I, I do believe that we have a shot together. We have a shot of having a more fair monetary system on the other side of this reset if we can all come together and place that vote. I mean, I, I have hope. So they can find me if you just do on YouTube, the Lynette Zhang. Um, same thing on Twitter and on Instagram and Facebook. It's just Lynette Zhang. And please come and visit. Let me know where you're from. I love that. And um, we love questions. We, To your point, we love questions. Question everything. And it's an honor for me to be here with you. Thank you so much, Lynette. Thank you, Andrew McGuire and Lynette Zhang, for another fascinating discussion here on Live from the Vault. And, uh, you know, remember one thing, buy physical, buy physical, make sure that it's backed one to one and understand the difference between what Andy affectionately calls the casino paper, gold and silver markets and the actual physical gold and silver markets. They're not the same. Don't be fooled. And there you have it, ladies and gentlemen. That's all we have for you today on another episode of Live from the Vault. Now, keep, please help keep spreading the word by hitting that like button. It really helps the channel and also share this information. And if you haven't already done so, subscribe. And if you click on that bell right there, you can see it. If you click on that bell, you'll be notified as each episode goes live. And with that, we'll see you next time right here on Live from the Vault. See you then.